Like a lot of people, I was raised Christian. But by the time I was only six years old, I'd already begun to grow cynical. I remember being in Sister Mary Majola's first grade classroom, being taught things about Jesus that I just couldn't accept as being true. And ever since then, I've spent my whole life seeking the truth. Who was Jesus and what was he really teaching? In the film Beyond Me, I made the case for how all of human suffering and misery comes as a result of impressions made on our consciousness over hundreds and even thousands of lifetimes. Unfortunately, the inclusion of reincarnation made the film a non-starter for a lot of people as it went against their core belief systems. But I knew Jesus would have had to have taught reincarnation. How could he not? Every great master that's ever been on the planet has all taught the same thing, including reincarnation. Why would Jesus be any different? For instance, 98% of the teachings between Jesus and Krishna are the same, except for reincarnation. How does that make any sense? And so I set out on a quest to find the lost teachings of Jesus and what happened to them. And in the process, I've made some really startling discoveries. I've become absolutely convinced that at the age of 13, Jesus traveled to India to do his training under some of the greatest swamis, rishis, and yogis of the time. And prior to leaving India to go back to Palestine, Jesus foretold of his own crucifixion as he knew exactly what was waiting for him in Jerusalem when he got there. But what is most shocking of all is that Jesus survived the crucifixion and moved back to India where he lived until the age of 115 and is buried at the Rosabal Shrine in Srinagar, Kashmir. Now I know this is hard to believe for a lot of people, but belief systems are psychic penitentiaries for our minds. And if we're going to evolve as a species, we need to move beyond belief. This is the Rosabal Shrine in Srinagar, Kashmir, the final resting place of Yuz Asaf, otherwise known as Isa, Yeshua, Yesu, and Jesus. Yuz Asaf means leader of the healed, and there are no less than 30 ancient manuscripts and documents from Turkey to Tibet that indicate that Jesus, Isa, and Yuz Asaf are all one and the same person, and that placed Jesus in the decades after the crucifixion in Turkey, Persia, Pakistan, India, Kashmir, and elsewhere. We'll cover much of the significant evidence suggesting that this is, in fact, the real tomb of Jesus later in this film. But just to give you a tantalizing glimpse of things to come, take a look at these footprints that were also discovered at the Rosabal Shrine. In these footprints, you can clearly see for yourself that they have markings on them the exact same places that nails would have gone had they been pierced through someone who had been crucified. And they match identically the patterning on the Shroud of Turin, the wounds of someone who had a nail driven through their feet, left foot over right. While the evidence is not ironclad, the case for Jesus doing his training in India during the block of 18 years unaccounted for in the Bible is substantial, and there is certainly nothing untenable in this view. In fact, it's quite the opposite. There isn't a shred of evidence to support the theory that in those 18 years, Jesus stayed back in Palestine, becoming an enlightened master while being a carpenter. As you begin to sift through the information in this presentation and do your own research, Ask yourself which version of events makes more sense. The orthodox view presented in the Bible or the alternative explanation of events provided here. One thing is very clear. A very famous holy man was buried in the shrine 1900 years ago. A man so highly regarded that kings honored him and that the shrine built for him survived to this day. You be the judge. Examine all of the evidence and the case presented here to you, and ask yourself, could this be true? Based on some of the ancient texts that have been discovered, we can piece together a travelogue of Jesus' 18-year journey. At around the age of 13, when Jewish boys were typically engaged, and many of the prominent families in the region all wanted their daughters married off to this young sage, Jesus evaded matrimony by taking the old Silk Road and heading off to the east, to the land of the mystics. To take the old Silk Road, he would have first headed north from Palestine to find a caravan, and along the route, he would have made a stop at Damascus in Syria, and then head east towards Baghdad in Babylon. From there, he would have continued east 
towards the region near what is now known as Tehran in Persia, eventually reaching the city of Bactra in northern Afghanistan, before finally turning south towards the Indus Valley region in northwest India. By the age of 14, he had reached the holy city of Palitana in the Gujarat region in India, home of the Jain tradition. The Jain tradition was started 500 years earlier by the sage Mahavir Vardhamana at around the same time as Buddha, and it's even possible that Buddha and Mahavir's past had crossed some point in history. Mahavira taught that men and women are spiritual equals and that both had the right to search for ultimate happiness. Jesus stayed and studied with the Jain priests for a year and then headed further east to Puri in Orissa, home of some of the most holy Hindu temples and saints. It's worth taking a moment here to bring clarification to some of the many misconceptions about Hinduism, which many in the East don't even consider as a religion, but more of as a lifestyle. Contrary to conventional thinking here in the West, Hinduism is neither a polytheistic or pagan religion such as what existed in the Roman Empire at the time of Christ, but rather a monotheistic faith based on one universal supreme being. In fact, while Abraham is considered to be the father of monotheism, this is incorrect as Hinduism predates Judaism by thousands and perhaps tens of thousands of years. With such deities as Ganesha, the elephant-headed god, Hanuman, the monkey god, and many other gods, it's easy to understand how Hinduism could be mistakenly compared to the paganistic religions of the Romans with their many gods. But in Hinduism, these deities are all just representations of one supreme being. The teachings in Hinduism can be traced back to the Vedas, which possibly go back hundreds of thousands of years. Nobody knows. Hinduism already existed long before Krishna was born 5,000 years ago, and it even existed before Rama lived, somewhere around 10,000 years ago. While at Puri, Jesus would have visited such regional holy cities such as Rajariha and Benares, and ended up staying in Puri for about six years, studying the Vedas alongside the Brahmin priests. Eventually, however, Jesus began to do what he did best, which was to share his egalitarian knowledge with both women and with people within the lower caste system in India about the inequities he saw and errors in Hindu doctrine that became distorted and diluted over time. As a result, he upset the Brahmin and warrior ruling elite classes, and there was a plot to assassinate him. Forewarned of this threat, Jesus then escaped Puri and moved on to Kapovastu, another holy site in India where Buddha had trained thousands to become enlightened, and he stayed there for another six years, studying with the Gautamites, learning the Pali and Tibetan languages, and thoroughly reading all the ancient Buddhist scrolls there. After his stay in Kapovastu, Jesus then headed to Lhasa in Tibet, where the Mansur Monastery was built for the Dalai Lama in the 1800s. He then traveled along the Himalayas to Leh in Ladakh, home of the Hemis Monastery, and then began his trip back to Judea. On his return trip, Jesus traveled through the Rajasthana region in central India, then north to Kabul, and then west to Persepolis in Persia, where he stayed for a length of time with the Zoroastrians, a religious sect that also purportedly started some 500 years earlier. But that date is subject to speculation. Again, after some time, Jesus had upset the local priests, and they set him out amongst wild animals, presumably to meet his own demise. But he once again evaded death and moved on to Athens, Greece, home of the great philosophers Plato, Homer, and Aristotle, before then heading across the Mediterranean Sea to Alexandria in Egypt, where he had spent some time in his youth, and then finally back home to Palestine. After a nearly 18-year spiritual odyssey, spending thousands of miles in dozens of countries, learning from all the great spiritual masters of the time, Jesus was ready to embark on his own spiritual ministry. We know all of this because it is all chronicled in the manuscript in this Buddhist Lama's lap, a document known as The Life of Saint Isa, the Best of the Sons of Man. In two separate locations along Jesus' ancient journey, in both Lhasa in Tibet, as well as Leh in Ladakh, there exist copies of this book that are dated back to within three to four years after the crucifixion, one in the ancient Pali language and another one that is translated into Tibetan. These manuscripts are still housed at these locations today 
and have been viewed by sources several times over the past 150 years and translated by at least two independent researchers corroborating the original text. In 1939, Elizabeth Kaspari, who was famous for starting the first Montessori school in the United States, along with her friend Mrs. Clarence Gask, while traveling through Ley, were shown the document and took the preceding photograph of the Lama holding the book. Fifteen years earlier, Swami Abedananda, an extremely holy man and disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, traveled to the Hemis Monastery to prove or disprove this document's existence and was able to completely verify the modern translation of the scroll. And in 1887, a Russian researcher by the name of Nicholas Notovich was the first Westerner to rediscover this ancient text and published a German translation in 1893. In the Hindu tradition, the head of the religion is given the title of Shankaracharya, which could be considered to be a title similar to that given to the Catholic Pope or the Dalai Lama. Sri Bharati Krishna Tirtha, the Shankaracharya in Puri, the same city where Jesus is said to have spent six years, was interviewed in 1959 about Jesus in India, and he confirmed with the interviewer that he had read manuscripts at the Jagannath Temple documenting Jesus' time there, and that Jesus was indeed known as Isa. And as recent as 2008, the current Shankaracharya, Swami Nishal Ananda Saraswati, also confirmed the existence of these documents at the Jagannath Temple. There is other evidence of Jesus doing his training in India, such as inscriptions with his sayings carved into temple walls, and customs and traditions that Jesus brought back from India to Palestine. But by far the most convincing evidence of all that Jesus did his training in India is the Gospel according to Thomas. Most people have still never heard of the Gospel of Thomas, and fewer still have ever read it, in spite of the fact that it only takes one to two hours to read. The Gospel According to Thomas was brought to prominence with Dan Brown's fictional thriller, The Da Vinci Code, but the important fact to remember here is that this manuscript is just one of literally hundreds of biblical texts written about Jesus that were lost, burned, or otherwise destroyed in the first three centuries leading up to the creation of the canonical Bible most people are familiar with. Undoubtedly, some of the books about Jesus were most likely fictional accounts authored by people who would report stories based on third or fourth hand testimonies, others that were inspired by dreams and visions, and still other documents that were probably flat out forgeries. Some housekeeping of the enormous volume of literary material may have been appropriate, but when you compare the vast amount of works that we know of, even filtering out some of the less credible material, against the material that was ultimately used to create the Bible, what you're left with is a set of documents that resemble a heavily redacted CIA memo. There may be some truth or facts left in, but so much has been left out that the pedigree and veracity of the original documentation has been compromised. Luckily for us, recent archaeological finds have provided us with fragments and even full books of the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, and the Gospel of Judas. What the hell is the Gospel of Judas? Nobody knew until about a year ago when it was published for the first time. It's 2,000 years ago it was written. And we knew there was one because Bishop Irenaeus mentioned it nearly 2,000 years ago. Bishop Irenaeus mentioned a lot of things. <laughs> yes, he did. That guy was a chatty Kathy. He was. But, but he also mentioned that there was a gospel that he thought was blasphemous and heretical, and most of the gospels like that were buried. Yeah, for what I understand, this is blasphemous and heretical. It says that That's Judas was Jesus' best buddy. That's what it says. This gospel gives a very different picture about what happened when Jesus was arrested and killed. Mm. And even in the New a Testament... A very, very false picture is what you well, meant to say? you know, there's a question about what's true and what's false here. Not to me. There's no question about what's true and what's false. <laughs> Bible true, everything else false. <laughs> Next subject. <laughs> that's you, you're what, not that's the what, first person to say what, that to you, right? No, a lot of people say that. That's how mm -hmm. a lot of Christians talk. They say, I know everything about Christianity. The way I interpret it is the only way. Yeah, because that's the Bible. The Bible is true. And the Bible says the Bible's true, and we know the Bible is true because the Bible says the Bible's true. Exactly. Is there part of that loop you don't get? That's right, because you see, the Bible has four versions of the story of Jesus, and they're somewhat different. Now we know there were many other Gospels written in the early Christian centuries the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, yeah, yeah, I Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Peter, lots of others. Yeah. There, 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 there lots of so, them out there. It was a cottage industry it at was the time. Everyone was trying to turn a buck on Jesus' story, right? That's right. Did and Judas he, write this one? 
We don't know does exactly. Does it say who Judas? It. You know, does it, it say it Judas? It says it? the gospel according to Judas. Judas, okay. And let me guess, Judas is the hero in this one. You are totally right. You know what? Peter is the hero in the gospel of Peter. And in the gospel of John, John beats Peter to the tomb. Everybody's just going to paint themselves, of course, as the hero. What it shows exactly is that, is that in the early Christian movement, there were different groups that you sort of gathered around different apostles and told the story of Jesus different ways. But we know Judas couldn't have written this one because Judas either hung himself or burst open in a field. Well, that's... <laughs> the Depending truth. on what you read. In this one, the other disciples stone him to death. So there are different versions of that, too. He's, they stone him to death and then he writes the gospel? That is a neat <laughs> trick. <laughs> Well, there's always resurrection, I guess. I guess so, yeah, but that comes later, is my understanding. <laughs> um, so, what, what, what is, besides the fact that, that Judas is Jesus' friend in here, uh, is, is there anything that this changes of our, our view of Jesus, or, or people who would accept the gospel of Judas as in any way legitimate, which I do not, um, would it change our view of the Christian message in any way? Well, it's not a matter of taking this gospel and throwing out the other ones. You know, it's not like this one's right, the others are wrong. But, but because there that, was a lot that, of isn't, censorship... Isn't, isn't, in, isn't in, in, inherent in my belief your wrongness? <laughs> I mean, that, no, that, 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 that's Christian orthodoxy. Inherent in your belief is a lot of authoritarianism, which oh, is the man. way a lot of Christians operate. Right. And what you see when you start to look at this whole spectrum mm -hmm. is that the early Christian movement had a lot of different viewpoints in it, and many of them were censored, and then one version got branded as orthodox. Right, That's the a version that God wanted, or else God <laughs> wouldn't have let God's message get, uh, get censored. That's what they say. Well, they but say it, God says. I mean, God's all-powerful, and God could have made this come out any way he wanted. And he buried this in the sand, and you are perverting God's will. <laughs> no offense. No offense. I'm not offended. Okay, good. What's fascinating is to see you know, who censored it, and what this does is fill in the gaps. I mean, there are many other ways of telling the story of Jesus and telling about what it means that we didn't know about. So this is actually a very new way of understanding the early Christian movement, not just this gospel, but all the others. You put these in, you've got a much more human story of the whole, of the whole movement. No, but uh, I understand in this story that, uh, or by the, some readings of this story, that basically it says there are other ways to God than through Jesus Christ. This one actually speaks of Jesus Christ. All of these Gospels do. Oh, they do. It just doesn't say that, you know, Jesus died for your sins. It says that this one shows that there are some people in the early movement saying, wait a minute, if, if you have saved Jesus died for your sins and God wouldn't forgive you without that, is God demanding human sacrifice? I mean, what kind of God is this? So this is a different understanding of the death of Jesus and the meaning of the Gospel. I'll tell you what kind of God is, one who believes in tough love. <laughs> all right, that's the Christian yeah, message, tough love, the toughest of all loves. Well, you know, even in the New Testament Gospels, you have different versions of the story of Judas. Like Matthew's Gospel says, why did he, why did he turn Jesus over to the people who arrested him? He did it for money. Luke's Gospel said he did it because Satan entered into him. John's Gospel said Jesus told him to do it. And this Gospel said that there was, in fact, um, a connection between Ju Judas and Jesus, and Jesus asked him to do it. So it, it's a very different kind of picture of the early movement. The whys and the hows of the censorship process and the geopolitical climate in the first few centuries is well beyond the scope of this documentary. But one thing is beyond debate. By the fourth century, there were two major branches of Christianity. There was the Roman version that was prevalent throughout Turkey, Greece, France, Italy, and the rest of Southern Europe, and that version was based predominantly on the evangelical efforts of Paul, who had never met Jesus and was converted to Christianity 14 years after the crucifixion. And then there was the North African strain of Christianity that prevailed in Egypt and what is now Tunisia, Libya, and southern Palestine. This southern version of Christianity is often referred to as Gnosticism, but that is somewhat incorrect. There never really was a religion called Gnosticism, but the word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know, as in know thyself, or self-realization. Ironically, when all the books considered to be Gnostic were removed from the Bible, Christianity itself became agnostic. This map is not meant to be an accurate representation of exactly where different versions of Christianities existed, but you can imagine that there would have been a geographical basis for the various flavors of Christianity that may have looked similar to this where the dark green regions might be where there was more of a majority of Gnostic Christians, and the yellow areas may represent the Pauline-centric base of Christians. 
There were some forms of Gnostic thought in existence already before Jesus, such as the Essenes, and by the 4th century, there were many Gnostic based sects that diverged from each other and yet they were all lumped into one religious group called Gnosticism, and the main tenets of this philosophy directly conflicted with the European version of Christianity. Major differences included liberation through self-discovery, and honoring and respecting women and the feminine aspect of creation and divinity. Mary Magdalene was viewed as Jesus' most advanced disciple. Interestingly enough, many of the core Gnostic teachings strongly resemble the knowledge held within the Vedas, and because the contradictions between the two factions of Christianity were somewhat mutually exclusive, one had to survive and the other had to perish. With the strength, power, and influence of the Roman Empire behind it, the Pauline version of Christianity prevailed as the orthodox, or correct thinking version, and all other versions were crushed. Fortunately for all of us, in 1945, in a small village in Egypt called Nag Hammadi, a cache of ancient documents was found that shed light on this alternative form of Christianity. The discovery at Nag Hammadi began with an Arab villager whose name was Muhammad Ali going with his brothers uh, on an ordinary errand. They took their camels and rode up to a cliff which is honeycombed with thousands of caves. They were digging under the cliffs for fertilizer, that is for bird droppings which fertilize the crops. And Muhammad Ali said his, his, he struck something when he was digging underground. And curious, he kept digging, and he, and he was startled to find a six-foot jar sealed. And next to it was buried a corpse. Muhammad Ali said he hesitated to break the jar because he thought there might be a djinn in it. But hope overcame fear. He, he said he picked up his mattock and smashed the jar and saw particles of gold fly out of it, much to his delight. But a moment later, he realized it was only pieces of fragments of papyrus Inside the jar were 13 volumes bound in tooled gazelle leather. Later, his mother said that she took some of them and threw them into the fire for kindling when she was baking bread. Uh, what he didn't know until, and what, what we didn't know until much later, is that these contained some of the most precious texts of, of, of the 20th century that they have uncovered for us a whole new way of seeing the early Christian world. There were 52 texts altogether, apparently, unless some of them were burned that we don't know about. And they contain secret Gospels, such as the Gospel of Thomas, uh, the Gospel of Philip. They also contain conversations between Jesus and his disciples that claim to, to go back to Jesus and his disciples. All kinds of literature from the early Christian era. Um, a whole discovery of text that rather like the New Testament, but also very different. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene, for example, shows us uh, a Christian community in which Mary Magdalene is regarded as a disciple, as a leader, as one of the major teachers in the group, and one who claims that women should be able to teach. Bishop Irenaeus coined the term we call orthodox. Now, literally in Greek, orthodox means straight thinking. It's like orthodontia means straight teeth. I mean, orthodox means straight ideas. And those who didn't agree with his ideas, he called heterodox. That means simply thinking otherwise. Or heretics, which means people who make choices about what to think. Um, Irenaeus didn't want people making choices. He wanted them thinking what the bishop told them to think. So by this definition of a heretic being someone who thinks differently, that would mean that this guy is a heretic. And what about this guy? And how about this guy? But wait, wasn't this guy a heretic too? In fact, wasn't he such a threat to the orthodox thinking of the time that they wanted to take the drastic measure of killing him? Not just once, but in Orissa, as well as Persepolis, and probably elsewhere along his odyssey? The true essence of what Jesus taught can be boiled down to this. We are not our bodies, and through self-knowledge, or gnosis, the kingdom of heaven is attainable by anybody. And not after this lifetime, but liberation can be experienced right here, right now. 
This is significantly different from the Orthodox Christian view of Jesus as a Redeemer and paints a completely different picture of Jesus as a Revealer, a Teacher, a Guru. In fact, the Sanskrit word Guru comes directly from the root words of darkness, or Gu, and to remove from, or Ru. And certainly Jesus was undeniably one of the greatest Gurus of all time. As a result in the difference between Jesus the Redeemer and Jesus the Revealer, through the eyes of an Orthodox Biblical scholar, most of the ancient manuscripts that embrace the Gnostic side of Jesus' teachings, such as the Gospel of Truth or the Gospel of Philip, are very challenging to develop interpretations for that fit into the Pauline model of Christ. Nowhere is this more true than with the Gospel of Thomas, which has arguably the most mystical, at times disturbing, and esoteric sayings of Jesus. My favorite of these is saying number 70, which says, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. After studying Eastern traditions for the past eight years, when I first read the Gospel of Thomas a few months ago, it made complete sense to me. And yet to many Christians, the sayings are a little bit more than difficult to fathom. As an example of this, the following sequence is a series of sayings from Thomas read by Professor Dale Martin of Yale University interlaced with my own personal interpretations of the same expressions. First look at 13. These are some sayings that look more odd to us. Jesus said to his disciples, compare me to something and tell me what I resemble. This is starting off sounding like what we've seen already. Simon Peter said, a just angel is whom you resemble. Matthew said to him, an intelligent philosopher is what you resemble. Thomas said to him, teacher, my mouth utterly will not let me say what you resemble. Jesus said, I am not your teacher for you. Now notice he, Leighton's letting you know. Are you using the same translation that I am? That's right. I thought I gave you the same translation. Leighton says, lets you know because you can't tell in English whether that your teacher is singular you or plural you. And he tells you it's singular in the Coptic. I am not your teacher. So Jesus is directing this not to all the apostles, but to Thomas in particular right here. For you have drunk and become intoxicated from the bubbling wellspring that I have personally measured out. Well, what the hell does that mean? And he took him, that is, took Thomas, withdrew, and said three things to him. Now, when Thomas came to his companions, they asked him, What did Jesus say to you? Thomas said to them, If I say to you, plural, one of the things that he said to me, you will take stones and stone me, and fire will come out of the stones and burn you up. This passage is really amazing. In this saying, we've got three of the most prominent heads of the early Christian movement all together with Jesus, and Jesus seems to be saying to both Peter and to Matthew, you guys just don't seem to get it. We've got Peter, who went off to Rome to start Christianity there, and you've got Matthew, who of course wrote one of the four Gospels in the Bible, and then you've got Thomas, who went off to start Christianity in India. And with Peter, we've got the devout, pious, religious man who looks up at Jesus and says, Wow, you're like an angel. Because through his eyes, that's what he was perceiving when he looked at Jesus. And then you've got Matthew, who's the thinker, the theologian, the guy who was stuck up in his head all the time. And he looked up at Jesus and said, Well, you're like a great philosopher. Because again, from his perspective, that's what he was seeing when he looked at Jesus. And then you've got Thomas, who innocently looked up at Jesus and said, Teacher, I can't tell you what you are like. To try to tell you what you are like would be a futile attempt to express the inexpressible. And Jesus says, Yes, you get it. And I am no longer your teacher because you've drunk from my wellspring. You've had that spark of divine consciousness ignited within you. And then he pulled Thomas aside and confided in him some even higher knowledge. Can it be any wonder then why the gospel according to Thomas was considered as heretical by the early Roman Catholic Church? Look at 15. Jesus said, when you, and here's a plural you, see one who has not been born of woman, fall upon your faces and prostrate, your, prostrate yourselves before that one, it is that one who is your father. Someone not born of women is your father. The supreme being has always been and always will be. 
There was never a birth, nor will there ever be a death. And so when you see the one that was not born of a mother, you'll recognize that as the father or the creator of all. There are some sayings that are just really inscrutable. Look at saying seven. Jesus said, blessed is the lion that the human being will devour so that the lion becomes human. And cursed is the human being that the lion devours and the lion will become human. What does that mean? I have no clue. And that's really honest. In this saying, Jesus seems to be talking about the ego or the mind. And he's using the lion as an analogy for the ego. Lucky is the ego that gets consumed by the man, that it gets to experience its own humanity. And foul is the man that gets consumed by the ego. And we all know people who are like this. And I think what he's saying in the last line, he's talking about reincarnation. And that the man who gets consumed by his ego has to come back in yet another lifetime to get another opportunity to kill the ego off so that it eventually can experience its own humanity. 97. Jesus said, What the kingdom of the Father resembles is a woman who is conveying a jar full of meal. When she had traveled far along the road, the handle of the jar broke, and the meal spilled out after her along the road. She was not aware of the fact. She had not understood how to toil. When she reached home, she put down the jar and found it empty. How profound, Jesus. She lost her meal, and she found her jar empty when she got home. I actually happen to think that this thing is very profound. In this expression, Jesus is using several analogies. The meal within the clay pot is representative of that spark of divine consciousness that resides in each one of us. The long road refers to the physical world that we experience through our five senses and that keeps us distracted from knowing our true self. The handle on the clay pot refers to our daily spiritual practices of yoga, meditation, service to our fellow man, all of those things that we do that help kindle that flame and help it come alive. When the handle becomes broken, or in other words, when we stop doing our daily routine, that flame becomes diminished or even extinguished. And by arriving home, what Jesus is talking about is our own physical death. So what Jesus seems to be alluding to here is just how important it is to incorporate some sort of spiritual practice into our daily routine. That when we go through life focusing on the world without, rather than the world within, we arrive at our destination spiritually broke. 98, right below that. <clears throat> Jesus said, what the kingdom of the Father resembles is a man who wanted to assassinate a member of court. At home, he drew the dagger and stabbed it into the wall in order to know whether his hand would be firm. Next, he murdered the member of court. <laughs> That's what the kingdom is like. Now you know exactly what the kingdom is like, right? In order to reach the kingdom of heaven, in other words, to become self-realized or enlightened, we first need to kill off our most determined and ferocious opponent, our very own ego, which can be extraordinarily powerful, clever, and cunning. And just like facing any other worthy adversary, we first need to train long and hard, both physically and mentally, to prepare ourselves. And when we think we're ready, we need to test our resolve to make sure we are. Only then are we able to conquer the ego and experience our own true divinity. 105. Jesus said, Whoever is acquainted with the father and the mother will be called the offspring of a prostitute. It is said that creation is comprised of both male and female aspects, where male is the consciousness and female is the physical plane or nature. Therefore, it could be said, rightly or wrongly, that your mother or the physical plane mates with every other male. Jesus said, it is amazing if it was for the spirit that flesh came into existence. And it is amazing indeed if spirit came into existence for the sake of the body. But as for me, I am amazed at how this great wealth has come to dwell in this poverty. What does that mean? In this passage, Jesus seems to be poking fun at all of those people who happen to think that consciousness comes as a result of brain function. First, he says it's an amazing miracle that all of this came into existence 
as a result of consciousness. And then he says it's an even bigger miracle to consider that consciousness comes as a result of all of this. But finally, he says, the biggest miracle of all is that divine consciousness came to reside inside of this abode, humanity, with all of our ignorance. Look at the very last saying. I hope some of you noticed this when you were reading over this before you came to class. Simon Peter said to them, Mary should leave us. He's talking about Mary Magdalene, probably. For females are not worthy of life. Jesus said, See, I am going to attract her to make her male so that she too might become a living spirit that resembles you males. For every female that makes itself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Passage 114 is probably the most commonly misunderstood passage within the gospel, according to Thomas, and the one that's most frequently used to discredit the book as a forgery or as heretical. But if you want to understand what this passage really means, you need to be able to look at it from the Eastern or the Vedic traditions. According to the Vedas, all of creation is comprised of both male and female aspects, a yin and a yang, the unmanifest and the manifest, consciousness and nature, where consciousness is considered to be the male aspect and nature is considered to be the female aspect. Now, I'm no expert on the Vedas, but it seems to me that what Jesus is trying to say here is that in order to be worthy of being a follower of his, that you need to have that spark of Christ consciousness ignited within you. And this applies to everybody, man and woman. This is what he means when he says to be made male, to be made conscious, to be made aware. Look at 24. I'm just picking out some sayings that are rather mysterious. His disciples said, Show us the place where you are, for we must seek it. He said to them, Whoever has ears should listen. There is light existing within a person of light, and it enlightens the whole world. If it does not enlighten, that person is darkness. In this expression, Jesus is saying that only where there's an enlightened teacher do the followers themselves also become enlightened. That where you have a teacher that's not enlightened, the followers remain in ignorance or in darkness. And this is very similar to another expression in Thomas where Jesus does talk about reincarnation when he says, when a blind man leads a blind man, they both fall into a pit. And a pit, in Jesus' symbolism, represents the womb. So in other words, when the blind lead the blind, they both remain in ignorance, and they're born again into yet another lifetime for another opportunity at redemption, salvation, or liberation. Jesus said, and this is 67, if anyone should become acquainted with the entirety, the pleroma, and should fall short at all, that fall person falls short utterly. This expression is one of my own personal favorites, especially in this field where so many people are trying to piece together all the different fragments of information that exist to understand Jesus, his life, and his teachings. And what Jesus seems to be saying here is that you can spend your entire lifetime studying all the scriptures that exist and all of the historical evidence. And yet, unless you've had that spark of divine consciousness ignited within you, you're going to have a hard time making sense of it all. Look at saying 61. Jesus said, two will repose on a couch, one will die, one will live. Salome said, who are you, O man? Like a stranger, you have gotten upon my couch and you have eaten from my table. Jesus said to her, it is I who come from that which is integrated. I, I come from that which is one. I come from that which is not divided. I was given some of the things of my father. I am your female disciple, she seems to say to him at some point. And then eventually he seems to answer, therefore I say that such a person, once integrated, will become full of light. But such a person, once divided, will become full of darkness. My interpretation of this saying goes something like this. What it means to repose on the couch means to meditate. And usually when we go to meditate, we do so with a sense of separateness between our minds and ourselves. But through the art of meditation, we're able to quiet the mind and experience our true essence, which is something far more vast than just our physical bodies. Therefore, what Jesus seems to be indicating here is that through meditation, 
we're able to put an end to the illusion of separation and experience our wholeness or become enlightened. Those that don't meditate go through life with a sense of disconnectedness or divided, and they remain in ignorance or in darkness. And then look at saying three right at the very beginning. Jesus said, if those who lead you say to you, see, the kingdom is in heaven, then the birds of heaven will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. But the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you become acquainted with yourself, now the word acquainted here means when you become really knowledgeable, and it comes from, the Greek word here is gnosis, where we get the term Gnostics. That Greek word means gnosis, but it, does, it means gnosis in, a, in, a, in some kind of technical way in these documents, which is, it's not something you just know with your head. It's something you really, really know. And so to express that, uh, Professor Layton usually translates this word as acquaintance, or becoming acquainted with it. When you become acquainted with yourselves, then you will be recognized, and you will understand that it is you who are children of the living Father. But if you do not become acquainted with yourself, if you don't have gnosis of yourself, then you are in poverty, and it is you who are the poverty. What Jesus seems to be saying in this passage is this. Anyone who teaches you that heaven is elsewhere, other than the here and now, is gravely mistaken. And those that take the time through introspection and meditation to know their true selves come to realize that we are all sons and daughters of a living God, and that Jesus wasn't the only begotten Son of God, we all are, and that those that don't meditate remain in ignorance, and are ignorance. All right, what's going on here? This document has caused, and still causes, all kinds of debate among scholars. You could go online right now, and you will see tons and tons and tons of stuff written about the Gospel of Thomas, some by real scholars and intelligent, wise people like me, although I've actually never written about the Gospel of Thomas because I don't want to go that, get in that mess. But I have good scholarly friends who publish on the Gospel of Thomas and argue their theories. Others by just absolute kooks <clears throat> who are using the Gospel of Thomas for all kind of experimental spirituality and religion and, you know, mind stuff. Look, the bottom line is this. Any Vedic scholar can provide a deep and profound discourse on the meaning of any number of Jesus' sayings in the Bible, and yet, not only can biblical scholars not make heads or tails out of the Vedas, most of them can't even comprehend Jesus' own sayings in the Gospels of Philip, Mary, Thomas, and hundreds of other similar documents that were destroyed and burnt. What does that tell you? Something serious and significant has been lost in translation here. And you have to ask yourself, which version of events makes more sense to you? The version that has absolutely zero supporting documentation that claims Jesus became this amazing prophet, staying back in Nazareth, working in his father's furniture shop, making tables and chairs? Or the version that does have compelling evidence that says Jesus became an enlightened master after he left home at around the age of 13, taking the old Silk Road to the east and traveling around to all the most spiritual and holy locations in Asia before returning home to teach what he had learned? There are at least a dozen other documentaries and books on Jesus in India that provide much more detail on the historical information provided here. Don't take my word for it. Do your own research. You be the judge. All I would suggest is to do it with an open mind and set aside any preconceived notions that you may have been told about what happened 2,000 years ago. From a historical perspective, we know that Jesus was alive after the execution attempt on his life. We also know that none of the original versions of the four canonical Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, John, Luke, and Mark, did Jesus ascend into heaven. This was only added hundreds of years later. Given that Jesus did his training in India and had previously traveled extensively throughout the East, does it not make complete logical sense then that he would have sought asylum in an ashram or monastery in an area of the world he knew he would be safe? In the first century Hindu text, the Bhavishya Mahapurana, there is a mention of King Shalavahana meeting with Jesus at around the year 80. Jesus told him that he was born of a virgin mother 
and that he had escaped persecution in the West by his own people and had escaped to the East. An ancient Chinese book entitled The History of Religions and Doctrines, The Glass Mirror, also contains a reference to Jesus in the East. At the throne of Solomon Temple in Kashmir, a building constructed around the year 78, some 45 years after the crucifixion, are inscriptions in the stone that say, At this time, Yuz Asaf proclaimed his prophethood, and he is Jesus, prophet of the children of Israel. Incidentally, in 1922, when Swami Abedananda traveled to the Hemis Monastery to confirm the story that Jesus had trained in India, the head lama there, when revealing the ancient scroll, The Life of Saint Isa, the Best of the Sons of Man, he confided in him that Jesus had in fact also returned to Kashmir after the crucifixion. In total, there are some 30 manuscripts in antiquity from Turkey through Persia, India, and Tibet that mention Jesus traveling through those regions in the latter half of the first century. And then we have the Rosabal Shrine itself. In the East, it was common to create footprints of a master next to their shrines, with something special engraved in the prints to signify their uniqueness. Buddha's footprints, for instance, had a swastika on them, and a swastika was a very famous spiritual symbol long before the Nazis plagiarized it for their own malicious purposes. These footprints found at the Rosabal Shrine have engravings in them exactly where a nail would have been driven through the feet if they were crossed over, one on top of the other. There are two graves at this shrine, one running north-south and the other running east-west. A Muslim saint is known to have been also buried in the same tomb about 500 years ago, and Muslim graves are always aligned north-south. We also know that this couldn't be a Hindu grave because they always cremate their dead. Furthermore, it's a Jewish tradition to bury their dead east-west, as this older grave is. Additionally, this old photo of the shrine has a cloth cover over it with Jewish colors and patterns. Taken out of context, each of the individual arguments for Jesus in India, both before and after crucifixion, may not seem very compelling. But when you look at the volume of information as a whole, it's hard to deny the very real possibility that this is exactly how things happened. Here's what we know. We know that approximately 18 years of Jesus' life are unaccounted for. We know that by the 4th century, Christianity had fractured into two distinct, somewhat mutually exclusive branches, one based in Rome that spread throughout Europe, and another version germane to the southern rim of the Mediterranean Sea. We also know that not only do these southern teachings more accurately reflect those of the very same region of the world where evidence suggests that he spent those unaccounted for years, but this knowledge also mirrors that of all the other great enlightened masters such as Rama, Krishna, Buddha, and every other lesser known self-realized teacher. We know for a fact that the Roman Church burned and destroyed hundreds of other manuscripts that contradicted or conflicted with their version of Christianity. 99% of the evidence in this case was destroyed. We know that after the execution attempt on his life, he was seen alive. We know that while there were two main branches of Christianity, the sect that coincidentally happened to have the might and power of the Roman Empire behind it, was the one that was able to prevail. Those are just some of the undeniable facts that we know. While certainly not incontrovertible, the evidence is very compelling that Jesus studied in India, brought Eastern teachings back to the West, and was branded a heretic, and therefore was tried, convicted, and executed. In fact, the evidence is so compelling that if the conventional thinking was that Jesus trained in India and died in Kashmir, and the burden of proof was on you to prove the Roman Catholic version, it would be impossible for you to do so. There is practically zero evidence to support that argument. So was Jesus the Messiah, or was he not the Messiah? Did he die on the cross and was resurrected on the third day? Or did he go into some sort of deep yogic trance? Or did he simply have a near-death experience like 7,000 people do every day in this country? Was he born of a virgin mother? Or was he conceived naturally, just like everybody else? I have no idea. And the more research I've done into this project, the less inclined I am to believe anything. See, the problem with belief systems is that once you start believing something, 
You stop seeking the truth because you think you've already found it. But you can't get the truth from a book or a film or a teacher. You can only get the truth from one place, and that's deep within yourself. All those other things can do is help till the soil and prepare you for your own personal journey into self-inquiry. The rest is up to you. I do know this much. The more that I've meditated, the more richness and texture I've been able to get out of the things that Jesus said. He was a phenomenal man, arguably the greatest Jewish teacher ever. And he said a lot of really amazing things. And perhaps the most poignant and simplest of all was when he said, seek the truth. The truth will set you free. And so I urge you, I implore you, to learn how to meditate. And then when you do, from that sense of knowingness or gnosis, then go back and read the Quran and the Torah and the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads. And when you do, what you'll discover is that each of these books says exactly the same thing. And that when we open up for an interfaith dialogue to discuss our differences, what you'll realize is that we don't have any. Just different ways of expressing divinity, which at the end of the day is a futile attempt to express the inexpressible anyway. Isn't it about time we stopped killing each other in the name of God? Your God is superior to my God. My way of connecting to divinity is better than yours. I mean, what is that about? Can we agree right now to choose a future of peace and harmony for all of mankind? Namaste.